Welcome to Pod Save America. I'm John Favreau. I'm John Lovett. I'm Tommy Vitor. On today's show, Donald Trump says indictments won't stop him from running. Ron DeSantis tells his Florida story here in California. CPAC is down to the most hardcore MAGA grifters. And Joe Biden balances public safety with self-governance in opposing D.C.'s crime reforms. And here to take us through all the weekend's GOP shenanigans is a reporter who was forced to endure CPAC in person. Semaphore's Dave Weigel. Welcome. Good to be here. My 16 CPAC, by the way. So I'm glad you have me. Wait, what? Numbers? I usually don't get to go on a podcast after they're over. 16? 16 yeah, CPACs? Yeah, yeah. That's so many CPACs. That's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> since <laughs> since the days when they thought George Bush uh, one existed, which is not really a thing anymore oh, no, at no. CPAC or the conservative movement. Oh, but since, since people would like... wake up at like 3 a.m. to go see George Bush. Yeah. Wow. I guess there's like a few CPACs a year. So it's not, right? Now there's there a... are. There used to be just one. Oh, okay. Be... That's, okay. that's part of the story. We'll that's, get there. Okay. I'm, we'll, I'm doing too much talking for no, to be introduced. This is good. <laughs> All right, let's get into it. Uh, Donald Trump dominated a conservative political action conference that was both emptier and more extreme than ever. The twice impeached loser of the last election handily won the 2,000 person straw poll with 62%. Ron DeSantis, who skipped CPAC, came in second with 20%. Failed Michigan gubernatorial candidate Perry Johnson, who I hadn't heard of until yesterday, uh, came in third with 5%. Nikki Haley got 3%. No one else broke 1%. Uh, Trump said right before his more than hour and a half speech that he, quote, wouldn't even think about leaving the race if he gets indicted and then tried to frame his candidacy as a vehicle for revenge. Uh, Here's a clip. In 2016, I declared, I am your voice. Today, I add, I am your warrior. I am your justice. And for those who have been wronged and betrayed, I am your retribution. I am your retribution. See some of that Stephen Miller speech writing is back. Some yeah. old, old you really, testament stuff. You really stuff can there. feel it. You really, right? Feel you get the mil- uh, Dave. What were some of the biggest applause lines from Trump's speech, and like, what was the general reaction from the CPAC crowd to Trump? Well, the crowd was there to see Trump, and we had spent three days. And more people came on Saturday just to just to see Trump, just to just to get in that room. Uh, rapturous for everything, I and mean, rapturous for just like what I what I'm kind of used to. In a, in a Trump stump speech now. And he hasn't made that many, but I still have the muscle memory for what kind of promises he makes. Uh, he's been, uh, I would say, was really striking how little applause there was for anyone but him. Uh, because Nikki Haley was there and half filled the room. You mentioned, as, as you mentioned, uh, Mike Pompeo was there, filled it less, uh, kind of lost the crowd a little bit as it, as it was going. And I try not to do the theater criticism version of of, of things, of watching a speech and, oh, and nodding. No, and, you should. Oh, but, <laughs> That's what we're here for. Uh, but it was, none were making an argument that, that you could sum up as Donald Trump used to be president, and, and but he can't win again. Kind, they would kind of hint at it. Uh, Haley hints at how we've lost the popular vote. Seven out of the eight, uh, last eight elections, hint, hint, he actually lost it. And Pompeo talks about, oh, he was tough on China and Trump was not, mm-hmm. to sum that up. Just people didn't react to that at all. Like, no one reacted to the lines that were, hey, there's this guy who's going to speak later and he can't win. No one reacted, totally sitting on their hands. Uh, every every Trump every Trump line hit, yeah, uh, it's, it's, uh, as usual. It's funny, just like, if Nikki Haley and Michael Pompeo have been observing Republican politics very closely for a long time. And, and the one thing we know really works for them is subtlety. <laughs> that's the, that's the <laughs> yeah. move for them. When you were talking to some of the attendees, were they as into Trump as they always have been? Or did you detect people being open to some alternatives, even if the sort of oblique lines from from Haley and and, uh, and Pompeo didn't really hit? Just a little bit of that. But then I'd ask about whether they're worried about losing to Democrats. And it was either... Uh... What, one person who said, who said they would steal it, which is actually a pretty common view. Um, one person who said they thought uh, Biden could win again because they, they underestimate him. The rest were basically anyone can win. Uh, Trump had it stolen from him last time. But this is this, the sample size. But this is about as half as big as CPAC in its prime. And if I didn't actually go to the, the 2020 CPAC that Borat was at, like the one where mm-hmm. COVID was coming down, you have the clip of Mike Pence saying, as of today, there are 27 cases of COVID oh, yeah. nineteen, like I wasn't at that uh, I that CPAC. That. I was I I skipped that. I was just covering Democrats, like everyone dropping out for Biden. Uh, and but I remember it used to fill that whole that whole uh, National Harbor, you know, conference center, and it didn't anymore. And but a lot of people left because uh, of the scandals around. Well, one scandal around Matt Schlapp, which he he has denied. Uh, making an unwanted sexual advance on a Herschel Walker staffer. They're in court. Uh, he says he didn't. Most Republicans will say he didn't. But a lot of them said, well, it's a great year to skip. So like Fox Nation skipped after spending a quarter of a million dollars. The RNC spent 
uh, eighth of a million dollars previous years. They skipped this one. A lot of people just said, it's not worth it. Maybe they'll come back. Uh, and it didn't have the function it used to of, well, there's Donald Trump, but what, or, or, or well, there's a Republican field. Who else is in this? It didn't have that function. It just was about uh, a Trump restoration with some other people allowed to come along and hang out. I didn't even hear uh, the only conversation about like who should run for vice president. It wasn't about Haley. It wasn't about uh, Pompeo or anyone else. It wasn't, about, it wasn't about Perry Johnson, who I knew I know more about, but I'm not sure it's worth spending time on him. <laughs> uh, it was Carrie Lake. Carrie Lake was there on on uh, for the Reagan dinner, and she won the VP struggle. It was just it was just a Trump crowd that thought he sh- he won the election. She won her election, even though that means they're technically both now president and governor. They should be they should run for president and vice president. That was that was the mood. Uh, Tommy, love it. Anything stand out to you guys from Trump's speech? Uh, I, I mean, I noticed, you know, as with any sequel, you got to kind of up the stakes. So we went from concern about socialism to Marxism is coming. Mm. So everybody keep an eye out for that. I noticed he flip flopped on early voting. Mm-hmm. We're now saying we need to swamp the left with early votes, mail in votes, same day votes until we eliminate ballot harvesting. We will become masters at ballot harvesting. Mm-hmm. That was interesting. They've sort of realized the political implications of telling lots and lots of people not to vote a way that makes it easier for them to vote. Um, there, I always take note of the isolationist language. There was a lot of like, mm-hmm. we should be in East Palestine, Ohio, and not in Ukraine. We should lock down our border, not the Ukrainian border. Mm-hmm. You know, there's, that's a very extreme sort of MAGA America first version of it. It did make me think, though, is this all that different than John Kerry in 2004 saying we should be building firehouses <laughs> in okay. Indiana, not Iraq, right? So I mean, there's sort of was, always yeah. a version of this in politics. So. It, yeah. It was it was a, a, a little bit different than that. Because I, I would say it was different than CPAC one year ago because CPAC 2022 is the same weekend that Russia invades uh, invades uh, Ukraine, yeah. and no one knew what to think yet. So you started to hear some people in the crowd. Uh, I remember talking to a, a congressional candidate named George Santos and asking for his take, <laughs> which is now the popular the mainstream take that we shouldn't we should be involved at all. Uh-huh. Like Russia's not that bad, etc. Um, but yeah, I remember a lot of the speeches made talked about the bravery of Zelensky, mm-hmm. and and they weren't the, the 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 narrative hadn't shifted yet to any money spent there is being taken away from widows and orphans in America. Right. Uh, it's also you mentioned the Kerry thing. The difference of that between that this and that though is they're not saying and we should also be spending more money, <laughs> true, <laughs> and, true. and they're saying it when you know, George Bush wasn't like passing infrastructure bills and right, like going right. to open bridges. Biden is so they're just it's just kind of like a a knee jerk line that is not followed up by and that's why we will instead of Ukraine we're going well I guess it's finishing the wall but not a b- bunch of other policy. Right. Trump has been kind of policy centric. Uh, in his in his campaign so far, and no one has really competed with him. I mean, Nikki Haley barely says what she's going to do, um, but it's not building more stuff. It's I'm going to get in there, lock the border back down, uh, stop Medicaid from covering uh, gender gender identity ish- therapy, all that. He he's been heavy on that, but not we're going to build things. It's that the country is about to collapse yeah. <laughs> because a, of Joe Biden. I mean, he's need to like stop him. Apocalypse. Not a fan of the yeah. um, flying cars in the Midwest mega cities. Oh, the like, freedom cities. That's a policy though. The freedom, freedom cities, cities. They do sound like just somebody. Somebody, somebody from the UAE just like talked to it's Trump a, and got him like yeah. got him at the buffet it's and talked for twenty minutes. Saudi neom, it's yeah, a little, like yeah, the long. Somebody shut like him the line. He saw the that city in the desert. Twitter, yeah, <laughs> things that no one would want to live in and no one will ever live in, but they look amazing on like a render that you, that <laughs> yeah. you can show somebody in a PowerPoint. That's right. And, he's, and, That's right. and I think I think my guess, uh, you know, having it's a couple of days ago, I haven't I haven't gone to his brain trust. My guess is like it looks if it looks really cool in another country, you do he does military parades, right? He went to France. They marched. He thought that looked cool. He tried to do it in America. Yeah, I think he's definitely been like MBS pilled by 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 the coolness of these city designs. You can tell that his staff is definitely aware of the criticism that all he does is talk about his own personal grievances because you mm-hmm. can hear him try to make the turn a little bit in the speech towards. Yeah. The grievances of others uh, with the retribution. I mm-hmm. am your retribution line. It just didn't make a lot of sense. I mean, there were a lot of January 6th people there and people wearing shirts like, you know, Ashley Babbitt murdered by Capitol Police. That was a theme there. So I think he was leaning into that, too. That was a hit. That well, was he, a hit. He for dropped a yeah January 6th song. He did. Yeah, he did. After he the, did. Oh, <laughs> literally after a collaboration with yeah. January 6th people who were in prison. It was him doing the reciting the pledge, I think, and them singing. I I've always wanted them to work together. <laughs> a lot of people have been saying that. I do think in general the crime stuff got – it's getting even darker with each new speech yeah. even if the yeah. policies aren't really changing. Like he's talked about the creating the tent cities before but now it's for the homeless, the drug addicted, and the severely deranged he's mm-hmm. added as well. He's talking about cracking down on juvenile – criminals Mm -hmm. uh he said uh on these out of control monsters young though they may be and impose tough consequences on juvenile criminals it's like 
Yeah. Pretty, it's getting pretty dark. Yeah, there's no point in saying, oh, how hypocritical that thing that Donald Trump said. Like, who cares? But but it is a reversal from the 16 and 20 versions where he was running against a Democrat who was there in the 90s and said, like, maybe maybe like some criminal should go to jail. And he real he he thought he could drive a, a, a truck through that with to some Democratic voters. I, I, like, still my favorite one of my favorite moments of the 2020 campaign, which is it's not hard to choose because it wasn't a very good campaign. Was there was like a week when there were ads in Pennsylvania both saying Joe Biden put too many black men in jail and Joe Biden is going to get rid of the police and you're going to get murdered. Yeah, and he's gotten more. I mean, he will never talk about the First Step Act again. Right, he's he, he's yeah, said he's, now he's now a crime guy. He's yeah, a he's crime vacillated, guy. but he mm-hmm. now has said a number of times that he that he that he blames. Jack Jared, yeah. pushing him into that. He regrets mm-hmm. it and sort of re- redounding back to his his comfort zone here. Yeah, th- I mean, this is who he, he was in the 80s, this is like, you know, Central Park Five Trump. Yeah. Um, so that felt, I mean, not just Stephen Miller gave him a script, but that feels very Trump. Like, he's watching TV, he watches, uh, you know, Newsmax or Tucker Carlson or something, and he sees the footage, you know, I could, you could probably all find the neighborhood, <laughs> and like Venice and like downtown LA that they f- get the B-roll. He sees that and he's like, lock him up, lock him up, put him in a, put him in a tent city uh, out in the desert in Palmdale. And he seems even more passionate about crime mm-hmm. than immigration even in in the mm-hmm. latest couple speeches like he still has his immigration lines but he really seems like he's zeroing in on the crime is where he really wants to uh mm-hmm. make his crazy mark yeah, um, we can I mean, look we can mock the writing and it is terrible writing but you see pompeo and you see haley up there with this, these insipid mm-hmm. boring flat speeches without much to say and trump gets up there and says i am your retribution and if i'm if i'm indicted i'm going to run even harder and it's he's he cosplayed as a candidate then he cosplayed as president now he's back and it's very it is powerful uh in that room also they sound both they both sound like Mm -hmm. you know neocons from the bush era right like trump started the speech with anti-war pro-entitlement rhetoric Mm -hmm. (laughs) bullshit as it may be like you Nikki Haley and, and and Mike Pompeo didn't even really try to go there. Yeah. Yeah. Trump paints the most apocalyptic vision of the future of the country out of anyone by far. I mm-hmm. mean, he literally says, basically, if you don't elect me, you're going to have World War III. In this context, he's talking about how easy it would be for him to stop the uh, war between Russia and Ukraine. But he means it in all kinds of ways, like culturally, the world is going to end. Financially, the world is going to end. The whole thing is a sort of like... It really is kind of an Old Testament apocalyptic vision. Yeah. And he's going he's to keep having that lane, if not to himself. I mean, DeSantis had no answer on Ukraine. Now his answer on Ukraine is the Trump answer. Haley doesn't have that answer. And there's just no right. a, a shrinking and shrinking and shrinking pool of Republican voters to, to talk to, to if you if you believe maybe America should take a, a role in helping Ukraine right. win. Right. That's not his position. That's not the, the one that's going to win. No. I think it would been cool if he, if he said, and if I'm indicted, I'm just going to like step back and really focus on my defense. <laughs> <laughs> so he didn't mention any of his current rivals by name, uh, though he did say this. We had a Republican Party that was ruled by freaks, neocons, globalists, open border zealots, and fools. But we are never going back to the party of Paul Ryan, Carl Rove, and Jeb Bush. We're not going back to people that want to destroy our great social security system. Even some in our own party. I wonder who that might be. So we've been talking about how Trump wants to define DeSantis and the other candidates as establishment rhinos in the mold of of Jeb and Paul Ryan. How much of a challenge do you think that will be for him, particularly with DeSantis? With DeSantis, I, the the opening is there because DeSantis was a congressman for six years. He was there during uh, during the n- not the first debt limit fight, but you know the let's stop Obamacare. He signed on to every Ryan budget, uh, so the numbers are there for it. It just none of that became became law. Uh, I think he can do it because DeSantis he could at least he at least um, stagger him because DeSantis is never. He just doesn't take questions from people who ask about that. Mm-hmm. I mean, he uh, he's on this, I think talk about it, this media tour, uh, this speaking tour. He talks to friendly media that just ask him how well he's doing. Uh, I mean, he's created created or, or handed handed like, you know, FOIA, FOIA, FOIA uh, advice to the to his friendly media. So he's like the most veal pen uh, candidate <laughs> in this race. He just never, he never has somebody ask him about a part of his record. And this is not like a scandalous part of a record. It became scandalous because Trump won. And, and you're not allowed to be uh, interested in 
sl- slicing back entitlements uh, in Trump's Republican Party. He's never asked. So I think I think it, it, if he forces tr- uh, DeSantis to an answer, uh, I think that's the first thing I think DeSantis like doesn't have a pat response to. Yeah. Now, the, the tough thing, guys, is when it comes down to the nickname. He's been mm. testing out even more nicknames. And if you want to cast DeSantis's establishment, you know, maybe you go with Ron Destablishment, which apparently he's testing out. Mm-hmm. Ron Dishonest. But then he's also been testing out Tiny D, which... <laughs> Mm-hmm. I don't know what you guys think. Grown adult, He's a grown adult. <laughs> I, I want to know who the freaks are when you're saying. That's what Love was, was just asking right. that before I, we were recording. Who are the little, freaks? I want to. I'm. I'm just. Let's see. I, we don't know who the freaks are. I, I'm like. There's, you know, there's there's homophobia mm-hmm. under freaks. I'm just it's something to keep an eye on. So mm-hmm. I'll keep our heads can't be, you're about us. Right now. You can't be a fun freak. Well, sure you can. I don't think that's what Trump would mean. <laughs> I think if we when he refers to Carl Carl Rove in the Bush years, you can think is he talking about Ken Melman, talking yeah. about the pro gay uh, side of the Republican Party. They're trying to kind of uh, excommunicate. Yeah, the. Uh, the, the tiny D thing, um, you know, it's because his last name starts with D and it could be a reference to his penis and he's short. Yeah, I hadn't thought did about you get it that like, way. Did you get it? But... <laughs> uh, I, I think, it's surprising. You I feel like Trump's attention span. I'm I, Trump on True Social, where his id comes out, he wants to share these things that kind of malign DeSantis as a weirdo, as a kind of ambitious, creepy guy. He shared the pictures of DeSantis as a, at a party uh, uh, with high school people, maybe. Uh, so I think it's a matter of time before he piv- this uh, Paul Ryan Republicans. That's not where his heart's going to be. He wants to call this guy a fucking creep, and he's going <laughs> to get there. And it's just a matter of time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I he he's been trying, and and within the media, I will see people react as if this is the mo- this is it, guys. Like this is what we've been getting ready for. Trump going negative. Just no one on the right ends up caring. I, th- I think they're they're such they're such strong uh, closure around around their media system that. I, I'll mention more than ever. I mean, even five years ago, I'd mentioned a Republican uh, voter or something I'd, I'd heard more than more than ever. If it's if it's like a Trump fight pushback against DeSantis, they haven't heard much about it because he does it on True Social. He doesn't do it when he does the you know Newsmax or John Solomon interview. Um, I mean, he needs to he needs to say more out loud. I think for for them to for people to become aware. Like, there's a video clip hmm. of him attacking, and he's he's been he he does he does have like the the poster version of his of his attacks and then the one that he will go out and deliver that's interesting because yeah. like we've been talking about how desantis has avoided criticizing trump directly because mm-hmm. he's worried about pissing off trump voters i wonder if the reverse is true as well where like trump doesn't want to go too hard again truth social aside for example he didn't mention desantis's name he you know didn't he said oh i mean wonder who i'm talking about i wonder if he's doing that because he knows that a lot of republican voters Actually, even though if they love him, they like Ron DeSantis as well. Well, like the ecosystem is different than it was in 16. And then 20, was, he's president, so it's, it's different. But he used, to, he used to tweet things. Everyone in the media is on Twitter. People in the media would write. I remember, I think it's CNBC, still has the image that pops my head every time of this is breaking news Trump tweet. <laughs> like the Chiron, <laughs> like it's announcing the land invasion. Um, and he doesn't do that. So he will, he will post some stuff on Truth Social and people on Truth Social will like kind of see it. And if you love Trump already, you say, I wish he wouldn't and you move on. Um, but he's not tried to, st- like, th- that's what's, there are many things different about this race, weirder about this race. That is the biggest one thus far is that the media is just, is just having, we're covering something that is happening next to the, <laughs> the DeSantis-Trump battle and nothing they're doing is, is, is being trafficked through the mainstream media. It's just like, like, people will will report back to like Maggie Haberman, John Swan, or whatever. He had this insult, yeah, uh, and and that's it. Like he's not going on. Yeah. But it used to be. I mean, I remember being in Wisconsin with making. like Ted Cruz. Trump had tweeted some stuff, and everyone in the press corps was like, "What do you make of this tweet?" And, Tr- and Cruz would say, "I don't like it." Well, there's there was there was that gathering in Palm Beach, and Trump could have gone much harder in that. It's like he, forget. Yeah. It, it's mm-hmm. like it, it, there's still um, he's leaving a little bit of like an off ramp mm-hmm. for people that are you know DeSantis curious. Or for people that issue, skip CPAC to do Club for Growth, he's still leaving space for those people to come home. Mm-hmm. I, I just I still find the Rhino thing hard to believe. Like I, I watched DeSantis's uh, Reagan Library speech, and mm-hmm. there is a very establishmenty vibe about him. You know, he's at this presidential library. He's not like the Gipper. He's not like a you know, thousand watt smile with his jokes he's told ten thousand times about Hollywood. But he's there with his wife and his four and his six year old, and they're telling stories, and he's trying to have a personality and seem like a human being, but he's more optimistic than Trump. What uh, what I thought he said that needled Trump a bit is he said, 
you didn't hear from my team lots of uh, leaking and backbiting. We just got stuff done. We did it efficiently. And we mm-hmm. beat the libs over and over again. That felt like a direct shot at the Trump White House. And then he said, he talks about how we didn't outsource decision making on COVID to Fauci uh, and creating, quote, a Faucian dystopia or a, quote, biomedical security state. So it does seem like DeSantis is just mm-hmm. really laying down a path to go hard at Trump over COVID handling. Yeah, everything you mentioned is is about Trump. He does that in his book, too. I mean, everything I pulled out from his, I did like a speed read it right as soon as it was coming out. Uh, and the stuff that jumps out is, is, it's not just how he retells the stories, but he'll mention... And then the White House got this wrong, or mm-hmm. uh, even the dis- the way that he uh, the, the the whole Disney thing, which don't need to like recapitulate the whole thing, but basically, he, he legislatively the way the way he took away the Disney state in Central Florida was attaching it at the very end of a special session. He has a whole section about how smart he was going behind the scenes to do that. Implication: There are some Republicans who are <laughs> unable to smartly do anything behind the scenes. It it leaks the front page of the New York Times. It leaks on. Right. They do a sixty minutes thing about it. Not him. I mean, he he just knows how to how to move in there with the seal the seal team and attack and win and get out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think you you cover this too. There's a number of times in the book where he talks about DeSantis talks about how he was ready to do the right thing and he had to wait for Trump to come on board. Yeah. I wanted to move the the. The embassy to Jerusalem, he had to get Trump on board. I wanted to, to uh, uh, do this on COVID, and Trump did or didn't know what was what he was going to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I, I would say it's even establishment. It really is. He is the, the like the Tea Party seed planted in 2011. That that is him. That is if it, that the Mark Meadows version of things. A lot of these guys melded with Trump, and their brands got crossed with Trump. But he is more uh, more of a 2011 like we need to destroy the left's march through institutions. And Tea Party was it was. I mean, it's a, some argument you could you could make about it was barely about finance. <laughs> like like, like the, the budget is not smaller after the Tea Party fades away. It was about uh, we didn't realize our country was being taken away from us. How do we get it back? And his answer 10 years later is, well, I figured it out. You just, you know, like win supermajority control of a state and pass bills and ma- watch them cry. And like what he's doing in New College, that's that general story of I use the power of the, of the state to d- dismantle the academic left. Trump was president for four years. Trump didn't do that. Trump never t- thought of attaching. So that's that point you make about the book. That's totally it. Everything. If you read it as who isn't good at this, <laughs> the answer in the book is always Don Trump. Yeah. Yeah. He says you don't see a drama and palace intrigue. You see surgical precision and execution. That's which right. Is just that's about Trump. Mm-hmm. Um, no, no Kellyanne Conway in the, in the DeSantis world. Yeah. I so I can't imagine that Trump's con- just back to Trump and CPAC for a second. I can't imagine Trump's comments about um, running if he's indicted are too surprising to anyone. But he also said that an indictment would increase his poll numbers. Uh, Tommy, what do you think about that? I mean, uh, it's stupid. <laughs> uh, may, may, maybe it would be the case. I, I, I remember well. Who was a New York Times columnist who said that the FBI just uh, gave the nomination to David Brooks, right? Yeah. So I think any kind of prediction like that is silly. Trump is obviously going to make the silliest version, which is it will help me 10 times more than you think. But I take nothing at face value from him. Yeah, I think it helps short term in a, in a primary. It didn't. I mean, I think when Brooks was saying that, the idea was because I remember I was in upstate New York for the special election where the Democrat was running on abortion. And, and I, I think the attitude was, well, is this going to be their answer to the Dobbs decision? And neither the can't neither the Republican candidate nor any voter put thought that way. <laughs> They're yeah, like, right. hey, that's Trump. He's that's probably a prob- They're probably ro- roading him or whatever. They didn't they didn't factor it in uh, for the for the hardcore MAGA voter. Um, he needs to spin it, though, because like Ron DeSantis is not going to be indicted for anything. Right. Uh, and, and he needs, he needs he, to make it a badge of honor. Right. You didn't get indicted. I did. He needs, he, you're, then, you're pushing them so hard. Where, why aren't they indicting you? Yeah, but he has like DeSantis has plenty of things that like the, the the wrong people attack him over. Just not like the he has, he has other things like he's been at war with the, with like the uh, federal government, the education, education department, the. He criticized the Mar-a-Lago, or he can do that. Mar-a-Lago, right? I should say he can do that stuff. He just like will not personally be indicted. So Trump needs to mm-hmm. do. But this is not like nor, this is really only as a Trump thing. There's never been another Republican who benefits from from actually you know, like committing a crime and, and being charged for it. <laughs> They'll say that I, I'm being railroaded, but yeah, I, I don't know how that's going to play out. I think it does give him a short term burst because everyone talks about him, and every other Republican will react by saying this is terrible. This is a miscarriage of justice. Yeah, I don't think it's like a, if DeSantis like runs a good campaign, I don't think that's going to be the. Yeah. Defense to stop I mean, him. I also think that there, if there is a uh, segment of the Republican Party that could potentially decide the primary that is very concerned with electability, mm-hmm. you know, uh, a Trump running with a couple indictments uh, might weigh on them a little bit more than you might think. Yeah, yeah. It would bother me. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just, just it, didn't, it didn't help Hillary Clinton when she was investigated certainly in didn't. 2016. It so, certainly yeah. didn't. Um, mm-hmm. Before we move on from CPAC, uh, Dave, any other notable moments or messages from uh, from that circus while you were there for those couple days? I, I wrote about how much uh, talk there was about China throughout every panel uh, and also partly because some people had 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 backed out like i mentioned uh these steve bannon's group with this uh chinese exile uh you know new federal state of china had a, a huge sponsorship and multiple booths and high te- a high tech audio, uh, audio visual room uh, <laughs> which i remember because i was interviewing them to get some facts about this group that steve bannon supports that wants to overthrow the chinese communist party and i was like who can i talk to for the facts and they brought me onto their tv set and just interviewed me <laughs> and, and i said well while we're here you were the facts guy <laughs> how many st- how many volunteers are at the conference uh and, but then uh, the, the Epic Times Network, the same thing. Like the, the new, like there was a ton of anti-Chinese Communist Party media, and this has been going on for years, like three, at least three or four years. That a lot of the um, Chinese exile, Falun Gong, like uh, let's we ca- we cannot have peace so long as Xi Jinping is is premier. Uh, they really were feeling themselves, and they were much more present. And that attitude that everything stemmed from stemmed from this coming conflict with China, which people like Joe Biden are making worse, which. Trump tried to win. We we blew past Pompeo, but like that's the point he's trying to make that no one's listening to is that Trump actually got kind of snowed by these guys. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't. Uh, I think he's attitudinally correct, like right there with the base, but just they're not paying attention to him. But the idea that China just literally like they they tried to destroy us with the COVID virus. They tried to destroy Donald Trump personally by releasing it when when it was an election year. They uh they're stealing our IP. They're spying on us. All all that much more like, kind of like a great power conflict mind. Mm-hmm. Even though they're moving away from from neocon. Uh, uh, attitudes. It's more like what I would hear from John Bolton 10 years ago at CPAC. And you were not hearing the same. We are in a, a night, nighttime, str- uh, midnight struggle for, for t- Taiwan. It's, it's really, it's not new. I mean, this is like who lost China is yeah. as old as, as, as this version of China. Um, but I wasn't hearing it at previous CPACs. The move was let's deescalate. It's the libs who want to, who want to bomb people and get into foreign conflicts. They're not saying we want a war with China. It's that we need, uh, what's it? Vivek Ramaswamy, who was also there, is like running for president based on on his on his book, um, uh, anti woke platform. Yeah, and his anti woke platform is like we need a declaration of independence from China, cutting off all manufacturing, all drugs. Go back to 1998 before we had trade says that was like not. I think it didn't show up as many of the articles because it was less of a headline grabby than Trump or like the anti trans stuff. But that was like ran through everything. Every other panel was, and also the Chinese are behind this, and also they're giving us fentanyl, and also they're addicting our kids to TikTok, yeah, etc. Incredibly conspiratorial. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Pod Save America is brought to you by Stamps.com. Level up your small business and set your year up for success by using Stamps.com to mail and ship. Stamps.com lets you print your own postage and shipping labels right from your home or office. Stamps.com has postage rates you literally can't find anywhere else, like up to eighty four percent off USPS and UPS, and If you sell products online, Stamps.com seamlessly connects with every major marketplace and shopping cart. Use Stamps.com to print postage wherever you do business. All you need is a computer and a printer. They even send you a free scale. We've used Stamps.com here at Crook Media since the very beginning. Since our salad days. Since our salad days. Send holiday stuff, t-shirts. Yeah. Don't go to the post office. That's stupid. Don't do that. You can't, can't triple stamp a double stamp. Yeah, what he said. I haven't thought of that movie in a long time. Set your business up for success when you get started with Stamps.com today. Sign up with promo code CROOKED for a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a free digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to Stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the page, and enter the code CROOKED. Pods of America is brought to you by ZipRecruiter. These days, job seekers want more. Everything from remote working conditions to an easier application process. Sometimes it can be hard to stand out to job seekers. How can you break through the clutter and attract the most qualified candidates for your business? The answer is ZipRecruiter. And right now you can try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash crooked. There are a bunch of ways ZipRecruiter helps you stand out to the right candidates. ZipRecruiter's technology sends you great candidates for your job, and you can send a personal invite to your top choices to make an impact. ZipRecruiter also makes it easy for candidates to apply to your job. In fact, they can apply with one click. Plus, ZipRecruiter offers attention-grabbing labels like urgent. (laughs) Yeah, that'll do it. Training provided, remote, and more that will catch the eye of quality candidates. Before ZipRecruiter, we would put a single blue flower at the top of a plateau in Tibet. (laughs) And if you got the flower and brought it to us... We would use it to make a medicine. I do not understand this reference. I thought it was in All the President's Men, but then you swerved. It is from Batman. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, okay. got it. Okay. Get your job noticed by the best and brightest candidates with ZipRecruiter. Four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. See for yourself. Go to this exclusive web address to try ZipRecruiter for free. ZipRecruiter.com slash cricket. Again, that's ZipRecruiter.com slash C-R-O-O-K-E-D. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. Pod Save America is brought to you by Karayuma, the cool, sustainable sneakers loved by surfers, skateboarders, and us. They're reimagining classic sneakers with you and the planet in mind. Karayuma is a B Corp certified sustainable sneaker company. I know you've been looking for one of those. Badass. Tommy. They're known for their reforestation efforts in the Brazilian rainforest. Their co-founders, David and Fernando, both grew up in Brazil, so this project is especially close to home. For every pair of sneakers sold, Karayuma plants two trees, and they've already planted over two million to date. We think that's great. We, we appreciate reforestation. We like reforestation better than deforestation here. Listen, That's our official stance. Yeah. I don't want to get serious 100%. on you, but you know, the Amazon's at a tipping point, so every tree kind of matters. Okay, Tommy's getting saying, serious. Yeah. <laughs> 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 who, who, David and Fernando? <laughs> a lot of people. Huh? I was like, tipping point, tipping point. Well, what do you want me to do? <laughs> well, <laughs> buy another pair of <laughs> Karayumas. Spring has officially sprung, and we're trading out the boots and cold weather kicks for something a little lighter and brighter. Crafted with organic cotton canvas and spring shades like... Rose, Off-White, and Green, our bestseller, Akalo, is sure to become your staple shoe of the season. And lucky for you, they just cleared a 77,000-person wait list. Feels like they're always clearing that wait list. With 10-plus colorways. Colorways? Yeah, sure. colorways. Yeah. We've that said that before. You've said that before. Really? Uh-huh. Uh, bold prints and collaborations with brands like Avatar, Pantone, and the Peanuts. That I remember. There's a pair for every personality. Even the shitty personalities. With over 33,000 five-star <laughs> reviews. Hey, do you suck? These shoes are for you. <laughs> yeah, we got a pair. <laughs> There's no wonder this ultra-comfy and celeb favorite style is flying off the shelves. The biggest difference between these sneakers and your old sneakers, Akka is actually comfortable with custom-designed cork and memory foam insoles to ensure a perfect fit. We love Karyumas. Great sneakers. Wear them all the time. I have so many pairs. I, I actually haven't ordered some in a while. So that's this is a good reminder that I need to go get some. Um, I need. I had to throw out an old pair. <laughs> they were my, my primary dog walking shoes, so I do need to get a new pair out of that today. Karyuma ships all their sneakers free and fast in the USA and offers worldwide shipping and 60-day free returns. They deliver right to your front door using single-box recycled packaging. And for a limited time, Pod Save America listeners can get an exclusive 15% off your pair of Karyuma sneakers. Go to C-A-R-I-U-M-A dot com slash crooked. To get 15% off, that's C-A-R-I-U-M-A dot com slash cricket for 15% off only for a limited time. Speaking of the anti-trans uh, rhetoric there, one of the more horrifying moments was when Daily Wire host Michael Knowles said that, quote, transgenderism must be eradicated from public life entirely, the whole preposterous ideology. He and the Daily Wire uh, then threatened to sue anyone who interpreted his comments to mean that he was calling for harm against transgender people. Um what do you think about his attempt at drawing a distinction there? Love it. <laughs> yeah. Well, so it's like, what does he mean? Right. Well, it's like you look at what the anti-trans far right actually advocates for when they say they want to when, when what he describes as ending transgenderism, which is they want punished. They want to punish doctors, provide evidence based care to anyone, teens, adults, anyone. They want to ban that care. They are doing that. They're banning it in Mississippi and Tennessee and elsewhere. They want to punish teachers who support and embrace trans kids and they want to make those teachers afraid to even talk about LGBT issues because they're not sure exactly where the law is going to end. They want to punish parents who support those kids. That's what they're trying to do or they are doing in Texas. And more broadly, they want to convince parents that trans that that if your child says they are trans, they are being deluded. They are part of a hoax. You should spurn them and not listen to them. This isn't this isn't real. Uh, They want to ban trans people from using bathrooms that match their gender, which is another way of saying they want to make it unsafe for trans people to exist in public. They want to stigmatize and ban gender nonconforming performances of all kinds. They want to malign nonconforming people and the entire medical community as a danger to children while claiming that in order to protect kids, they have to do medically, scientifically unjustified examination of kids in order to comport with an anti-trans moral panic about sports. And as they do all of that, They then mock anyone who trans, non-binary, just gay or queer or just not comporting with standards of masculinity and femininity. They want to ostracize anyone who does that as being depraved and a harm for children. So not only are we going to tell you what your gender is, there's only one way to be that gender. So it's live exactly how we tell you to live. Uh, Then you have our permission to exist. So no, I don't think there is a distinction. Uh, When they say they want to end the ideology, they do mean... They want to make it impossible for trans people or non-binary people uh, to exist in public life. Uh, And so they are part of an eradication campaign. 
as all uh, fascistic movements do, they like to troll and pretend they're not saying what they're obviously saying, claim to be offended when you point out what they're saying actually has implications. When, when, you, when, when they claim offense when you point out the implications of what they're actually saying. Uh, you know, it's, yeah. um, we're here to fix you, is what they want to say. The, like, that's, like Michael Knowles is kind of a slimy, like B-team propagandist of the Daily Wire. And he knows exactly what he's doing here. He chose the word eradicated for a reason, and he chose the word transgenderism for a reason, because he wants to make clear that he doesn't think transgender people have the right to exist, but then get offended when you point out how dangerous that language is or the logical extension of that language. And I agree with you, it's a distinction without a difference because he has said previously that transgender people, quote, not a legitimate category of being and therefore cannot be the target of genocide. But that doesn't make it better. You can't tell people that they are illegitimate. These are human beings. It's a group of people. You're saying you don't exist, that you that you you can't exist, you can't live your life in the way you want. That is the definition of dehumanizing language. And so, yes, this guy is like a B-list troll, but he also has influence. Until very recently, he did a podcast with Ted Cruz, until Ted Cruz dumped him to go take the show to iHeart. But he's not the only one talking like this. It's like TPUSA, it's Candace Owens types, it's the Daily Wire. And they try to gloss over it with like faux intellectual language sometimes. And then Charlie Kirk will go and say, man, we should take care of these trans people the way men did in the 50s and 60s, meaning physically harm them. And so I do think it's worrisome. It should be called out. We should refuse to play his little word game. And if he wants to sue people that say as much, fuck you, sue them. If someone gave a speech talking about eradicating Judaism or Christianity or Mormonism, uh, what do you think the reaction would be? Yeah, and, <laughs> if, and if they didn't say Jewish people, right? Like, come on. And this, you know, look, this is influential. Another Daily Wire person spoke at the bill signing of the Mississippi law. Uh, some of, Matt Walsh? Matt Walsh. Yeah, yeah. Some of the most incendiary, violent rhetoric. Uh, proudly embraces the fact that he uses violent rhetoric uh, around trans people. It talks about going to war against them. And so the other just point I would make too is that like the, this is the context of the current, this is the context of the state of politics around uh, uh, trans policy making. You have outright bans, you have fascistic violent rhetoric emanating from very big uh, media uh, organizations on the right. It is everywhere. It is on Fox. It is at CPAC. It is in the states. It is coming from powerful people inside of states. And then you have a very stupid conversation playing out on Twitter, dancing on the end of a pin about the meaning of the word bias. And people really do need to get their heads out of their asses and and stop focusing so much on the intra-liberal debate uh, taking place among a very small group of people and actually focus all of their ire and all of their attention on the actual threat that is playing out right now. Does the coverage that emanates from the New York Times, does that affect the coverage and the impact and the politics in places like Mississippi and Tennessee and elsewhere? It absolutely does. But we should focus on the actual ongoing emergent threat right now. I think if the New York Times didn't exist, uh, They'd still be doing that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It had, in those states. That would still be happening. I mean, a lot of the people uh, in in these movements, in these social conservative movements, look at what happened in the UK. I think they're they're speed running it in ways that are politically a little, a little riskier. The, the UK, this is a whole different topic. Um, but the UK, it's it's it, it's cross it crosses party lines. A lot of the the momentum for uh, rolling back like self identification and transgender rights comes from like these gay this thing called the LGB alliance. Like this this fairly fringe group. But there are a lot of I'm a gay man. I, I if I was a gay man and I I was given hormones and I was ten, I would have I wouldn't have grown up to be who I really am. That's kind of absent here. It is just the the Matt Walsh, uh, um, the Matt Walsh and Michael Knowles version of things, and it, you're, it's very coherent. And I feel like that is um, that lids, these things are just racing through state legislatures. There is no opposition that matters to to them when they pass. Uh, but as a as a polit as a political cause, it is concentrated completely within the Republican Party, and because it is, I think it's getting. Um, it's it's a little bit less. Let's let's worry about the children and more of that sort of you know patent in front of the flag rhetoric of we need to stop this right now. We are at war against this idea. I think any 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 people, especially conservatives, have been called out. The idea you could just obviate like an entire idea and way of being somehow legally and it'll go away. Um, I, I, I think that that's what happens when you just get so hyped up and you're not listening to yourself. You don't have a, it's not a strategy. It is just I want those people to go away and. And we've got momentum, so let's 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 pass them, make them go away forever. Law that doesn't really make sense, but they don't have left wing allies telling them to moderate these things like they do in the UK. It is very frustrating 
that this is the what is happening in our politics. And meanwhile, there's a vast kind of anti-woke ecosystem, the Barry Weisses and J.K. Rowlings and Bill Mars and now Dave Chappelle's of the world all kind of talking about the 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 way in which this whole debate is an imposition on them yeah. and, the, and the allegations against <laughs> them. That is incredibly frustrating. But politically, I feel like we have to move. We have to go past them and focus on the actual laws and the substance of the actual bills that are moving through the state houses and then make a larger argument about these people like Michael Knowles mm -hmm. and all these these right wingers who who they just want to tell you how to live in every way. They want to they want to tell doctors what to do and teachers what to do and parents what to do. You know, when Mark Kelly, there's a great moment that Mark Kelly had in that debate right before the election where he said something about um, uh, uh, that skeleton. What's his name? Blake Masters. Blake Masters. Blake Masters. Uh, this is the, we all uh, know said, guys like this. We all go know guys like this. And yeah. Michael Knowles is another guy like that. And we need to get back to, to a, a larger argument about the way in which they are trying to tell people how to live their lives and tell parents how to parent and teachers how to teach and get it out of this kind of yeah. bias, well, broader debate that plays out amongst very engaged progressives uh, online. Great segue, because uh, one of the people who's trying to tell people how to live their lives like that is Ron DeSantis. You sure bet. Is. Uh, so let's dig a little bit more into his speech at the uh, Reagan Library in California that happened on Sunday. Uh, let's take a listen. It's ideology run amok. That's why the quality of life has declined in places like San Francisco and New York City and, and Philadelphia and Chicago. It's all rooted in that. And that woke ideology rejects the core foundational principles that have made this country great. So in Florida, we say very clearly, uh, we will never, ever surrender to the woke mob. Our state is where woke goes to die. Tommy, you were talking about what you thought of the speech. I'd like to hear more. It, it struck me as this is like the first like full Ron DeSantis speech that I've listened to. I thought it was interesting that he began by trying to tell like the Florida story, the story about Florida. And it was much more of like a general election intellectual pitch about what's happened in Florida than I had expected from Ron DeSantis. A lot and of it, economic data. Yeah, yeah. which, made, which yeah. made it really wonky and a little boring. And then he gets to the culture war stuff at the end of the speech, and that's where all the applause lines come in. But it's interesting because we were just talking about Trump's speech, and Trump sort of flips it. Trump didn't speak about the economy and inflation until an hour, 30 minutes into the <laughs> CPAC speech. Yeah. Yeah. And DeSantis does most of the beginning of the speech all about that. I thought that was interesting. Well, and that to me was what like gave off the establishment vibes and sort of the Reagan vibes. I mean, he DeSantis also has this little sort of war of words going with Gavin Newsom where like Gavin yeah. Newsom yeah. attacks him in the press and puts up posters in Florida or in Texas about how great it is to live in California and they go back and forth and it frankly benefits both of them. So I wonder if part of that was just needling Gavin Newsom and talking about how much better it is to live in Florida or have a business in Florida than California, which has seen net outflows of residents and blah, 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 blah. Yeah, he's He's like, when I was growing up in Florida, you never saw a California license plate. Now you see them all the time. Yeah, they yeah. Oh, it used to worry us. Yeah. And, you know, so, I, you know, I, I th there is there there's a piece of the message that's like, I'll do all the culture war stuff, but I'm also good at the job and I'm competent and I'm a little less of a psycho. And, he can, and if he wins the uh, primary, he can just sort of drop the last quarter of the speech yeah. <laughs> well, or at it, least minimize it. Right. The, the anti-woke stuff is why he's famous. The economics is more why he's popular. When the, the national press covers his CRT, anti-diversity, anti-gay, anti-trans stuff, that's what covers the news. But then the part that probably had the biggest impact is a bonus for teachers or raising teacher salary minimums, right? So he has been very smart. And we should be aware of that, too. He's a great electability argument, too, which he barely won in 2018. Mm -hmm. And then he kicked Charlie Chris ass uh, in 2022 by like a million votes. Yeah, he doesn't even say as much as he could. I mean, that they like got a super majority. They now have like no Democratic opposition to speak of. Like they humiliated like every, everyone up and down, up and down the ballot. It's also it's also co coherent. So the thing that if you're like going to the Reagan library to see him and, you know, you were like a deputy undersecretary of something and you retired to. Uh, uh, you, you, you know, like Sherman Oaks and you want to see him, you want to hear more about the economic stuff. It's more that he is a, um, like Trump, although Trump kind of came around to it, it's kind of ham, ham, ham fisted. Like the DeSantis theory of how the world works is just there is an incompetent elite who was revealed by COVID to be incompetent. We never need to listen to them. And if, and if hey, if they were wrong about COVID, what else are they wrong about? I bet everything. I bet they're wrong about everything. Uh, so look at our mm -hmm. look at our tourism data. And then while you're looking at it, look at our school choice program. Look at our bill that makes it illegal to for, you know, if 
a fourth grade teacher to mention to have a to have a rainbow flag in the room. Uh, experts hated that. Well, they're wrong about COVID, right. and that actually, as as just like an icebreaker, as a way to as a way to get an audience going, has been very effective. And he's built on it with um, and we, uh, this very you know they I think. Liberals think you you mentioned Orban in Hungary, and that might that might spook people in Florida. Not 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 a not a not really controversial to be there. There is cross pollination that they talk about between a European state that figures, all right, we don't trust the experts. We're going to build our own national national state and go back to traditional values. Exactly what he's doing, and so he actually does, I don't think sells it as well as like unlike Trump, where I feel like once he's rolling, he's the best at explaining why why like people liked him in in office. The DeSantis version can be a little more boring than the one that. Excites people so much, which mm-hmm. is like I am going to personally. It's not just I like humiliated Fauci, but I humiliate like the medical whole entire medical industry. The same people who are providing you know har- uh, HRT and stuff, they're probably wrong too. They're probably in it for the money too. It's it's like I don't know how long, he can, but I sometimes hear people think, oh, can you just talk about COVID forever? And it's it's more than COVID. It's like yeah. every time I'm tested, I, I disagree with the establishment, and I'm right. Yeah. The thing I'm trying to figure out is about this primary with him and Trump is it seems like. DeSantis's argument is it's a very intellectual argument. Mm-hmm. He's trying to make a case. He's trying to like it's a it's a head argument, right? right? And obviously there's a I think among college educated Republicans we're seeing this in the early polls already. Mm-hmm. DeSantis is like crushing Trump among mm-hmm. college educated Republicans. But knowing the composition of the Republican Party right now and how most of the party now is non-college educated white folks, I sort of wonder um, if there are, and there's more of them than the college educated set in the Republican party, sort of wonder if that argument will find an audience as big as Trump's argument. Yeah. I mean, I feel like the Trump, uh, what you were talking about, trying to make him look like part of the establishment thing is a good way in just anyone who's been, who's held elective office can't be trusted, which is something like DeSantis trafficked in. Like he won his house seat by beating a guy who'd served one term in the state legislature and he called him a career politician. Like he knows how this works. Yeah. Uh, but but that that DeSantis argument, I mean, he has like Leonard Skinner wrote a song for him. He does have that appeal to the beer track voter. And he destroyed. I mean, he had like historic margins with exactly the kind of voter we're talking about. Better than Trump. Yeah. Not just like Miami and Palm Beach County, but like that guy who has the Trump flag. Absolutely. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, the, the flag I've seen, I've been in Florida in a minute, but I've seen a lot of like Trump DeSantis flags. It is just the convincing people that you should dump him and put him in power. Uh, but I've ne- I've not met a Trump voter who does not like DeSantis. At mm. worst, they're like, he should just get more seasoning and, and then be president for eight years after Trump. And it does seem like, and you guys were talking mm-hmm. about this with DeSantis's book, it seems like his argument against Trump that's emerging, and mm-hmm. right now it's a very sort of oblique argument, is that Trump was just sort of messy and undisciplined. Mm-hmm. And, it's a confidence thing, yeah. Yeah, right? And that like the guy, first there's an electability argument. There's also a, he made decisions not he wasn't great at making decisions he was kind of impulsive you see his behavior you don't like his behavior Mm -hmm. i'm like just a smarter version of him yeah i'll I'll, I'll own the libs without the chaos even even the way they talk about college like trump loves talking about how he went to a good college remember i think one of his worst political antenna moments was when he makes fun of biden for not going to as good of a college as he did in the debate and and like the sam's version of things like i went to harvard and yale and i learned i must destroy these people (laughs) like he never (laughs) emphasized he went there except to say like and i learned that they that they are destroying america from within they have been for decades not look at my shiny degree like doesn't doesn't care about it yeah sometimes sometimes people make good points (laughs) (laughs) I'm just worst person you know yeah yeah, the worst person I know just made a really good point (laughs) (laughs) so here's some of what DeSantis wants to get through Florida's uh, annual legislative session that begins this week conceals carry without a permit uh, eliminate diversity and equity programs at state colleges expand school vouchers allow death sentences without a unanimous jury repeal in-state tuition for dreamers make it easier to sue the media for libel and uh, and further restrictions on abortion uh Love it. What do you think uh, are the biggest targets on that list for Democrats should, well, I was going to say should DeSantis make it to the general, but maybe to start talking about right now while he's still in the primary. Yeah. So just first of all, I, when, when he did the uh, banning of diversity and equity programs, he said he wants to fight ideological conformity, which but and the way he's doing it is by uh, banning one kind of teaching and mandating Western Civ. And it's like nothing, <laughs> nothing makes us more kind of ideologically heterodox than everybody does a week on the fucking Greeks and then everybody does a week <laughs> on the Romans and then one week on Jesus, then about the Dark Ages. Um, 
that's just a small point I wanted to make. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, okay. Well, Trump is talking about architecture too. They're yeah. all sort of doing oh, a version it's of this. all this, yeah. this, just this. It really is just like, I don't know why these things always end up going together, but it is just, that's fascism for you. But um, oh, yeah, Trump wants to clean up the building. He wants to, yeah. Wants to figure... They want Roman columns. They want, they want symmetrical columns, big fucking arches, none of this <laughs> modern shit. This is like, it's 2023. Like, pave a road. Is you're against the Bauhaus? What the fuck is going on? <laughs> So stupid. Like, I would be trapped with these fucking assholes. Anyway, the point is, <laughs> two, two policies I'd pull from that. One, further restrictions on abortion. Florida currently has a 15-week abortion ban that has exceptions for life or serious injury, but not for sexual assault or incest. Danza, D- uh, DeSantis is aware of how uh, bad the politics on this are. He barely references abortion in mm-hmm. the book. Uh, I, I think it seems like he'd hoped the 15 week ban would get him through, but it won't. Activists feel like he's not leading. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a push for a six week ban. He has now embraced that push. Uh, the only reason, the only thing that stands in its his way is a Republican supermajority and some resistance among Republicans in in the Senate. Uh, so that's that is going to be, I think, something Democrats try to make toxic with some hard votes, even though they don't have the ability to stop it. And then the other is concealed carry. Only 14% of Americans want looser gun laws. Most Republicans don't. Most conservatives don't. Concealed carry without a permit is an 80-20 issue, even among Republicans. Only 35% support it. I think abortion is a big one. Then the, con- then the permitless concealed carry. And then he's going after these fucking dreamers. Rick Scott signed the bill to uh, uh, allow dreamers to use in-state tuition by 80-20 Americans, Republicans, everybody believes dreamers should be able to stay and have a good life. And it's this cruel thing. Rick Scott went out of his way to criticize DeSantis over that. The only reason he's doing it is it's such a fucking loser of an issue. Yeah. The dictating what exactly is taught in our schools yeah. and going through colleges too, he it's I don't think it's I don't think it's super popular across the country because it doesn't it doesn't really scream freedom. Yeah. Well, well, that's why he <laughs> makes the point about we're fighting ideological conformity. He 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 feels the weakness that he's going after people's ability to learn what they want to learn. Yeah, right. and, and unlike the sort of Michael Knowles of the world, he tries to scope his culture war arguments in ways that sound more palatable. He's like, look, we're just we're just telling teachers you can't teach sex ed to you know third graders. You know, he's like, what's so crazy about that? He acts like sort of the left completely overreact. But you know, arguably maybe the most important. Bill for DeSantis in this session would be one that would allow him to run for president without resigning first. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I saw, I saw yeah, that one. So He's slipping that one in. Keep an eye on that one. <laughs> Pod Save America is brought to you by Article. Article has everything you need to organize your bedroom, living room, and dining room with dressers, nightstands, sideboards, and more. Plus, they've got all the other furniture you could want to get your space looking its best. We love Article here at Crooked. We sure do. Got tons of Article furniture. Got some chairs. Got some desks. What other kinds of furniture are there? Couches. Sure. (laughs) Article believes in delightful design for every home, and thanks to their online-only model, they have some really delightful prices, too. Their curated assortment of mid-century modern coastal industrial Scandi, that's Scandinavian, (laughs) boho designs make furniture shopping simple. You like the boho? Boho is fun to say. Article's team of designers are all about finding the perfect balance between style, quality, and price. They're dedicated to thoughtful craftsmanship that stands the test of time and looks good doing it. Article offers fast, affordable shipping across the U.S. and Canada. Plus, they won't leave you waiting around. You pick the delivery time and they'll send you updates every step of the way. Article's knowledgeable customer care team is there when you need them to make sure your experience is smooth and stress-free. Article's offering our listeners $50 off your purchase of $100 or more to claim. Visit article.com slash crooked and the discount will be automatically applied at checkout. That's A-R-T-I-C-L-E dot com slash crooked for $50 off your first purchase of $100 or more. Pod Save America is brought to you by Rocket Money. The average person has around 12 paid subscriptions. Think about that. Pause. Two wow. seconds. Well, thanks for... 12 uh, seems high, but I guess, yeah, if you do the counting. I mean, I just I went on my, like, Apple app when it shows you the subscriptions just through Apple. And there were so... I'm like, what, what am I doing with this? If you think you're only subscribed to a handful of services, you might want to double check. With Rocket Money, you can quickly identify and cancel all your unwanted subscriptions. Rocket Money, formerly known as Truebill, is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps you lower your bills all in one place. Over 80% of people have subscriptions they forgot about, like that streaming service you bought to watch just one show. That's speaking to me. That's what I've done. Or that free trial that you never even used. Also me. Rocket Money will quickly and easily identify your subscriptions for you so you can stop paying for the ones you don't want. Simply find the subscription you don't want and press cancel, and Rocket Money will cancel it for you. No more long hold times with customer service or tedious emailing back and forth. Rocket Money makes canceling subscriptions as easy as the click of a button. 
Over 3 million people have used Rocket Money, saving the average person up to $720 per year. Love Rocket Money. Used it. Need to probably use it again. Yeah. So uh going to set up an appointment with Rocket Money because uh, too many subscriptions right now. Stop throwing your money away. Cancel unwanted subscriptions and manage your expenses the easy way by going to rocketmoney.com slash crooked. That's rocketmoney.com slash crooked, rocketmoney.com slash crooked. Pod Save America is brought to you by Noom. Talk about a diet trend, intermittent fasting, loaf, how you feel about it. Intermittent fasting. I mean, it seems hard. <laughs> It's all, it almost works, you know? In theory, it, it seems almost like works. It. it basically just means it's a very fancy word for skip breakfast. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Starve yourself for half the day. Just Well, yeah, skip breakfast, but also it's like... Early dinner. Skip breakfast, early, early dinner. Early dinner. And then n- shut the cutting fuck out up. snack time after dinner. I mean, it's, see, I'm not a snacker. Or crush me. I, that's how I could do it. I did it. I've done it. I could do it again. <laughs> Trends and fads come and go, especially when it comes to health and wellness. Noom is not a fad. They use psychology now trends to help you make intentional and sustainable choices that are aligned with your values and weight loss goals. With their psychology-based approach, Noom empowers you to build more sustainable habits and behaviors. The program helps you understand the science behind your eating choices and why you have cravings. Whatever your health goals are, the flexible program focuses on progress instead of perfection. Choose your level of support from five-minute daily check-ins to personal coaching. First-time Noomers lose an average of 15 pounds after being active in the program for 16 weeks. Noom's approach is grounded in science. They've published 50 peer-reviewed scientific articles describing their methods and effectiveness. Stop chasing health trends and build sustainable, healthy habits with Noom's psychology-based approach. Sign up for your trial today at noom.com slash crooked. That's N-O-O-M dot com slash crooked to sign up for your trial today. Check out Noom's first ever book, The Noom Mindset, a deep dive into the psychology of behavior change, available to buy now wherever books are sold. Um, All right, before we go, um, President Biden caused a a bit of a kerfuffle last week when he tweeted the following about the D.C. Council's changes to the city's criminal code. Quote, I support D.C. statehood and home rule, but I don't support some of the changes that the D.C. Council put forward over the mayor's objections, such as lowering penalties for carjackings. If the Senate votes to overturn what the D.C. Council did, I'll sign it. Uh, This enraged many criminal justice advocates, D.C. residents and House Democrats, many of whom just voted against repealing the new criminal code after the Biden administration had released a statement that also opposed repealing the new criminal code on the grounds that, quote, Congress should respect the District of Columbia's autonomy to govern its own local affairs. Okay, so for people who may not know. Uh, who wants to talk? What's the backstory on this crime bill and and why can the federal government overturn what the D.C. Council does? Well, D- D.C. is as not a state. Uh, please call in with your comments about this. I mean, it's in the Constitution <laughs> as, as, as a zone where the government works. It has a home rule deal with Congress. It's had, had rights uh, mostly expanded since the 60s, never not really retracted, except when Newt took over. They took a couple powers away because Marion Barry was mayor. And there, there is a tug of war where um, D.C. representing liberalism, representing you know, like a majority black liberalism and urban policy is a punching bag for Republicans. That's just been that's been true for uh, the entire history of home rule, really, since the 60s. But home rule just specifically says that Congress reviews, can yes. review legislation passed by the D.C. Home, City Council. Yeah, home rule is again, referring to the powers D.C. has. But like in case you get out of line, and this is something that like a lot of states have, have Florida, good example. Lots of lots of laws in Florida are passed like, hey, your city is not allowed to do X, Y, Z. The difference is you can still like elect a state rep from that city. You can't in, in Congress. Right. Just right. you have no, no voting representation. So that's the backstory. D- Congress has the power to do, to do this. Uh, D.C. had been working on updating its criminal code, which has not been updated in decades, uh, with a combination... hundred years, I believe. Yes, right? yes. Uh, I mean, there have been tweaks, but like right. like the last time Congress overturned him of the D.C. criminal code, it was they they reduced like the criminal penalties for like adultery and sodomy, and Congress said, no, 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 no. <laughs> we need to keep that on the books. Congress. Um, and, but they've been doing this for a while. Uh, they The mayor opposed some changes to the code that were more lenient. They were like lowering the sentences guidelines, specifically carjacking. Carjacking is the one that gets the attention because there's been a rise in carjacking, just like teenagers jacking cars because they um, nothing else to do. Uh, it, it increased some other penalties. It created like gun crime penalties that didn't exist before. But the, the council didn't do a very good job explaining any of this. And there was a kind of, to the extent anyone heard about it outside D.C., it was the mayor was against part of it. A lot of mayors, I mean, like Larry Lightfoot just went down in flames because there are a lot of Democrat mayors. If crime went up under your watch, you either quit or lose. You need a good explanation for it. But they dawdled because they're not used to Congress. They, they, I think they had confidence in Biden. They had confidence in the Democrats in the Senate. They dawdled and they let it get into this zone where there's 30 days that you have to overturn one of D.C.'s um, laws. And their lobbying was 
please save this law because it's 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 not the, the mayor's letter to the Senate, et cetera. Their lobbying was not, we're going to defend this bill on the merits. We're going to defend how it actually increases penalties. It was, hey, this is not nice. Like DC's uh, taxation was that representation. You're doing, you're violating our sovereignty. So they managed to get a fight with Biden over that without getting into any of the substance of, of the law, which is I mean, uh, Mark, Mark Joseph Stern at Slate has a good article about the criminal code. There are things in there that are politically toxic, but like there's any bill, any update to the like, code, you can like sell it in a, in a particular way. You can emphasize like, actually, this puts more people in jail for like violent crimes, or you can not say anything, <laughs> which is what they did. So there's like a little political story here about the D.C. Council of just you know, Demo- they're all Democrats having no idea how to like politics, just do politics. Um, but the larger story is, yeah, they tried to update this this code. It was a I mean, you had a mayor who looked like the, the, the iconic Marion ba- Mario Bowser, the mayor of D.C., uh, move was she painted Black Lives Matter uh, on 16th, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, 16th Street in front of the White House. And then activists painted equals to fund the police. And she painted over that <laughs> like she is a very symbolic. Let's keep thing. Let's keep the party. Let's keep the party going while saying all the Black Lives Matter slogans kind of mayor. And none of them are good at politics. Like none of them, none of them were in a good position to say, here is a great series of reforms that will make the the city safer. What they were competing with and they had no idea about is Republicans going home and see their, their, their voters see images of DC on TV or they'll hear reports about the crime there. And it's just an easy punching bag to say, I went there and I'm not going to let this, this city that can't govern itself, like uh, make it more dangerous. I'm trying to go to work in DC. Um, yeah, just just a case of just you know some good some good policy ideas, some probably bad policy ideas, and just like awful politics, not taking not taking seriously that a new Republican majority in the House of like five you know a five seat majority or whatever absolutely cannot wait to like dismantle DC laws. Mm-hmm. They hate it. Tommy, what do you think of the criticism of uh, Biden? Well, so yeah, I mean, t- today's point. I mean, it's it's important to point out the mayor of DC opposed the bill. Right. Uh, her veto was overridden. She mm-hmm. says she supports ninety five percent of the bill. The, the parts she's worried about are parts that she thinks would explode the number of misdemeanor cases that end up in jury trials. She's mm-hmm. worried if every misdemeanor case goes to a jury trial, it will overwhelm the system. They'll never get anything done. Whatever. The other part is this. Uh, you mentioned carjacking. It, there's a provision that drastically reduces the penalty for armed carjacking. The so, recommended penalty, because right now it's well, 40 years, and it would, oh, you're going to explain. Well, so yeah, well, yeah. Well, today, what I what I read, and tell mm-hmm. me if I'm wrong. Today, I read that if someone commits an armed carjacking and the victim is not injured, the minimum sentence is 15 years. The new bill says the maximum sentence would be eight years. So it's a big difference, yeah. according to the mayor's office. So um, Biden is getting hit on a, a number of fronts. The first is people who are saying he's undermining DC statehood. Mm-hmm. And I get where they are coming from, but this is not a DC statehood bill. He would sign a DC statehood bill. It's a bill going through the current established, but also dumb process, right? So like mm-hmm. he's just working with the system he's got. The second criticism is people who say he's undermining criminal justice reform. Um, but I think what Biden would argue is I'm in favor of decriminalizing marijuana or reducing drug sentences, but I never came out in favor of cutting in half potentially the sentence for an armed carjacking. Um, The third criticism is from Mm -hmm. Democrats in the House who voted for this bill, thinking Biden put out an initial statement of administration policy uh, that made it seem like he had pledged to veto the bill, even though the SAP didn't specifically say that. And now these House Democrats feel like they had the rug pulled out from under them because now Biden says uh, he um, it, it will allow the bill to pass. So I think that is a very fair criticism yeah. from House yeah. Democrats who are like, yo, no heads up, mm-hmm. confusing statement of administration what do we policy. Think Democrats there? did a terrible job at every part of this. Yeah, well, that, that's still the mystery to me is there's somebody in the White House staff who put out this memo. It wasn't a veto statement. It was just like, we're against the bill. And then there's the president who well, didn't well, agree with that. And that's weird. That doesn't happen that well, often. Well, you guys know that like the, the, the White House comes into a position re- remanded by the president once he finds out about it. There's this weird yeah. wonky process. I remember learning yeah. about it like six months into the White House where bills come out and all of a sudden there will be a statement that comes out from OMB called a SAP, Statement of Administration Policy that sort of lays out how you feel about it. And that's what this is that we're talking about. And we're talking about that. And I guess there's just been no real coordination on how that came out and what it really meant. Yeah, very good PR push by the antis, by the Republicans on the car. The carjacking he mentions in his tweet, the president mentions in his tweet, that is just a very vivid crime that has gotten a lot of negative attention in D.C. 
the irony being most most of the the gruesome cases are like teenagers who wouldn't be subject to the full criminal code because they're juveniles. But every time, I mean, if uh, every it, it bleeds, it leads. Every time there's one of those stories, even I'm I'll be across the country and I'll hear about it. I'll mm-hmm. I'll like notice a uh, Fox News does have as much as there's like closure around conservative media. Fox News has the power by it ping pongs it to a member a Republican member of Congress that Republican member of Congress makes a speech. Fox News was was driving a lot of this. The White House re- re- reacts to Fox News, and the D.C. Council doesn't. And the rest of Democrats, like Durbin, the rest, I think they just didn't know what was going on. As far as I can tell, they just had no idea that, yeah. like, the, the, what was how this is going to play out. Yeah, I do. It's also you know this is a criminal justice reform bill going to going for whatever tacit approval to a empower a recently elected Republican House, many of whom have said they want to uh, uh, have more authority over D.C. One of the people that has spearheaded the effort to uh, uh, reject this law wants to repeal home rule altogether. Yeah. And so in that ban abortion in D.C., you know, repeal the gun laws in D.C. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so in that context, they this bill goes from the this bill is they overcome the veto Mm -hmm. uh, of the mayor. And the mayor basically says, I won't lobby for this through us, through us, through someone on their team says it's not up to the mayor to lobby for something she doesn't believe in. Mm -hmm. Right. Which is just. You have a kind of divided D.C. government sending up a controversial bill in which you need basically democratic unanimity. Yeah. Uh, and once it was clear that it might not ha- might not be able to get through the Senate, uh, which it was very easily going to lose, you know, your mansions, Manchin, your yeah. cinemas, then a couple others. All of a sudden, it's whether or not Biden is going to uh, 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 actually veto it and make this a national issue. And clearly they I, decided not to. And they'd rather the yeah. the. the I'm going to say it, Suris, of D- of angry House Democrats who are right to be angry about this. Yeah. Uh, and angry D.C. advocates who mm-hmm. are right to be angry about this than have a national issue in which but D.C. Democrats supported I, I these also, carjacking rules. I mean, yeah. there's, there's, there's two issues here. One, is, you know, there's criticism that um, the president can't be for D.C. statehood and 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 self-rule while still repeal, signing the repeal of this criminal code. And I just think that, like, you said this, as of right now, the federal government still has the legal responsibility to review what the D.C. Council does, right? Mm -hmm. Like, we wish it weren't so, but that's the law right now. And I don't know that they can abdicate that responsibility just because um, they don't like what the law and the Constitution... They usually do. Like, the council will pass something and then Congress won't do anything about it. But 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 what I'm saying is, if Congress takes it up, if the Republicans, which they did in this case, and decide to pass a resolution... Joe, I don't think the Joe Biden Democrats can just say like, oh, well, th- the reason we're not doing anything about it is because we don't is because we don't like the law, because if the D.C. Council, right, decided to outlaw abortion in the district. Mm-hmm. And I suspect that most pro-choice activists and progressives and us would be saying, hey, Joe Biden and the Democratic Congress, you should step in and do something about that because you have the power to do it. We probably would. Yes, I think that's right. Right. I, I also so do- we, so I think we have to separate that from the substance of the law, which people don't people aren't as exercised about. Of course, but I, the the re, but the reality here though is that this is not because the, the the Democrats feel a responsibility to govern D.C. It is because they know your your soft on crime, your pro carjacking is a more powerful and potent attack than I was just deferring to the city council as as we all believe we should do. Yeah. Right, but I, I think. All of the focus has been on the politics of this and the politics of crime, but mm-hmm. like, and obviously the carjacking has received a lot of attention. And, and Mark Joseph Stern's piece mm-hmm. in Slate is interesting on this, and it's it's been widely circulated. And he talks about how like the maximum sentence for armed carjacking has been reduced from forty years to twenty four years, even though the harshest penalty for that crime that's usually given is around fifteen years. So he's like, "What's the problem, right?" But then, like, if you look at all of the reduced maximum penalties in this bill, now this is the five percent that Bowser Mayor mm-hmm. Bowser said she doesn't approve. They um, carjacking that includes bodily injury is reduced from twenty one years to just four years. That's the most common type of carjacking. They reduce the maximum sentence for first degree murder from life without parole to forty years. They reduce the maximum sentences for first degree sexual assault, kidnapping, criminal abuse of a minor, and gun crimes at a time when the number of shootings have been on the rise since the pandemic. So, you politics aside, like. Was it smart to do that extra 5% that that if everyone agrees that 95% of the bill is great, critics and, and supporters are like, great. And Mayor Bowser basically said, can you fix the 5% that's not great? And they said no. So like, well, let me let me play Ron DeSantis here and preempt DC's. But like the pattern in DC, like in a lot of cities has been uh, 
they you look at data. The data shows most people getting 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 arrested and getting put in prison are black and not white. And there have been responses to that policy. This was the most considered of them. I think the the less considered was the in 2018 the council uh, lowered the penalties for like jumping the the turnstile and like you know riding the metro for free, riding the bus for free. That has its own backlash. It's not as bad as this. This was procedurally what you should do, which is yeah. years of study for, for doing this stuff. They had they experts. Just, that was yeah, really yeah. well thought out. <laughs> they really did think it out. It was just they ran into the buzzsaw of, and, and I, the reason I mentioned dawdling, because it, it is kind of complicated, if they just moved faster and did this in like October, con- Congress's role was done. They, you, you can only do this because they passed it late enough and because Bowser vetoed it. Just everyone in the process made a mistake not knowing that Congress would would, would, would do what, what the Republicans of Congress said they would do. But the, yeah, that is... There are reasons that considered reasons why they tried to reform this, but it all got caught up in that discussion with the mayor. You also have, Indi- I mean, I, I worked at the Washington Post. You have at the, at the Washington Post editorial board the voice of a city that, that the that voice of the city that says, "Don't lower any, any. What are you doing? Like, we need to like sell this as a place to live that is as good as it was last year, as good as it was ten years ago. Don't change this stuff. You like, they're not calling for harsher penalties. They're just, they're just saying like, why, why do any of this when the city's image and the actual rate of crime is higher? And you've even seen people, like that attitude has been bubbling up. So as a political issue for Republicans to pick, it's a great one. It's just not as like it, 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 it's, it's. Again, like it was something the city did not just because they felt nice and because somebody said Black Lives Matter 2020. They're trying to do a bunch of things with this bill. It just they just did it really with poor timing and, and, and bad that's the, PR. That's yeah. the shame of it too. Yeah. It's just like well, yeah. And you know the politics of this have turned completely south because uh, the D.C. Council is trying to withdraw the proposal and act like it never happened. And Republicans in the Senate are saying, "No fucking way, we're going to have a vote on this. We want the vote. This is good for us. We enjoy this." Yeah, I'm excited. So Republicans have basically said, "Oh no, you can't! No, no take backs! You, can, <laughs> you can't! You can't withdraw it now, even though the city council is trying to withdraw it." But it does seem like they could then just fix the the most objectionable parts of this. Like you said, we have ninety five percent of a bill that everyone agrees on, and then yeah. just pass but, it again, right? Th- from a policy standpoint, I do think that's the key for people who really do want to see you know criminal justice reform pushed forward, which is the city council should work with Mayor Bowser, fix the things they need to fix, then pass it totally. again. together, then, totally. align before Absolutely. they send it to a Republican House, and maybe mm-hmm. and maybe also then call Joe Biden and the Democrats and be like, "You guys okay with this?" Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then somebody talk to Joe Biden just have a meeting in the process. Have a meeting. Oh, come on, but drop by. Thirty one House Democrats voted with republicans uh on this initial on this initial bill so yeah Yeah. there's there was some bipartisan concern from the very beginning including from congresswoman angie craig who was very recently assaulted in her own building the day of the vote vote. i mean this is the thing and i mentioned fox not just i'm like it's on fox so it must not be true no it's like when i travel the country and i mention oh I've lived in D.C., worked the Washington Post. It's become a thing. If I'm at a Republican event, they'll ask me about if it's safe there. The same way that people ask if L.A. is safe. Like, it was getting that reputation. And I think the city was, like, naive about this. They just, like, didn't believe that it traveled that far. People had this thought. There is clearly uh, there's a concerted effort by Republicans to paint uh, mostly black Democrat led cities as unsafe sort of urban hellscapes. They do it to San Francisco. They do it to L.A. They do it to Chicago. It's it's clear what they're trying to do politically. There's very uh, overt racial elements to these arguments. But, yeah, it, it's something I think. Yeah, there's there's that. Challenge. There's that that's been happening for the last 40, 50 years. Yeah. And then there's the reality of people in these cities who are genuinely a little worried about absolutely rising, uh, you know, crime, particularly when it comes to gun crime. Mm-hmm. Um, some other forms of crime have actually gone down. But, yeah, when there's like more gun crime, then people mm-hmm. are going to get nervous, mm-hmm. you know, and it's sometimes it's simple as that. Um, okay, that's our show for today. Dave Weigel uh, from Semaphore, thank you so much for coming and uh, for regaling joining. us of Tales from CPAC. We <laughs> you can't it. see it at home, but uh, Dave is waving two gigantic flags um, throughout the entire episode. <laughs> Which flags? Well, he's doing Semaphore. <laughs> so you actually got the name. So oh, I have no I idea what a Semaphore is. Can you tell us? It's an yeah, art. It's not, an, it's, not, it's an art, right? It's, it's, a, a, it's, it's an a art of flight signaling no, so a boat that. or a plane can you know, go into the harbor or land. Semaphore. Correctly. Did Ben come up it. with this shit? Hey. Um, <laughs> he did. Well, I don't know. I wasn't there for that part of it. I was there for like the putting out the publication part. Right, right. And you know right. what Semaphore is. And we know what it is. This. No, that we know what that is, but the publication? Semaphore, yeah. It's, it's online? It, it's online. It has newsletters, one of which I write called Americana. Uh, I get that one free. delivered to my inbox yeah. all the Thank time. You. It's a great, it's a great fantastic news newsletter. Mm-hmm. And it's a great outlet. So, uh, Dave Weigel, thanks for joining. Everyone else, we will uh, talk to you Thursday. Bye.